Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a pina colada. What about you, Del? I'm drinking a virgin martini, and on this week's episode, we will be looking at the murder of Bianca Devins. This case examines what happens when jealousy and anger meet and results in the loss of life of a 17-year-old girl. Bianca Devins met Brandon Clark through Instagram, and they met in person at Bianca's graduation party. They were friends, but Bianca knew Brandon wanted more than just a friendship. There are conflicting sources on whether they had engaged in a sexual relationship. One of Devins' friends suggested he may have taken advantage of her sexually while they were high on drugs, which her friend said Clark would give her sometimes so she would spend time with him. Nevertheless, Bianca did not want to be in a formal relationship with Brandon and described him as a close friend to her mother and sister. Investigations into Clark's internet history suggested the possibility he was obsessed with Devins. He searched her name and frequently checked her social media platforms and saved pictures of her. Bianca graduated from high school in February of 2019 and at the time of her death, was enrolled in Mohawk Valley Community College in Unica, New York, to study psychology. She struggled with mental illness in the forms of depression, anxiety, borderline personality disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Her mental illnesses led her to seek refuge in online forums, including Discord and 4chan. According to the Post Standard, Devins had been dealing with online harassment by incels for at least two years. Though she did not have a large following, she was targeted by incels as an ESOP, which is incel slang for a woman who has engaged in sexual intercourse. We will talk more about the incel culture in our discussion. Brandon Clark grew up in an unstable household where his father repeatedly abused his mother. When he was 10 years old, His father held his mother at knife point for several hours, leading to him being placed in state foster care. When she met him, Bianca's mother described him as, quote, charming and, quote, polite. Conversely, a childhood friend described him as obsessive, noting his fixation with Pokemon and Lollipop. This difference makes sense when considering the fact that he was trying to impress Bianca's mom in hopes of furthering his relationship with her. On July 13th, 2019, Bianca and Brandon went to New York City to attend a performance by Nicole Dollinganger. While there, they met a mutual friend named Alex and together smoked cannabis in Brandon's car. At the show, Brandon saw Bianca kissing Alex and he later stated this enraged him. Later that night, Bianca fell asleep in Brandon's car. He then woke her up and started arguing with her about kissing Alex. Bianca apologized but told Brandon that they were not in a monogamous relationship. Lieutenant Brian Coromato of the Utica Police Department described this moment as, quote, Devin's making it clear they're not together, end quote. Unsatisfied with her response, Brandon allegedly began assaulting Bianca on a deserted dead-end road. He then started stabbing her with a long knife that was hidden by his seat and sliced her throat, which almost decapitated her. He allegedly left her body in the car and started a bonfire. After Bianca's death, Brandon called his family members. The calls worried them, and they called 911. They later stated the calls felt like a suicide note. Brandon took pictures of Bianca's bloodied body and posted them on a Discord server. They were accompanied by a caption that said, quote, sorry fuckers, you're going to have to find somebody else to orbit, end quote. By 7.20 a.m., people from the Discord server had started calling the police to report the images. Clark also allegedly called 911 and stated, quote, I killed my girlfriend, unquote. He also tried to contact Bianca's family. When the police arrived at Bianca and Brandon's location, Brandon stabbed himself in the neck while posting more pictures of Bianca online. Immediately following his attempt, he reportedly laid down across a green tarp, which was concealing Devin's body. Brandon was taken to the hospital and recovered from his self-inflicted wound. 
Clark reportedly spray painted a suicide note and a message was found nearby reading, quote, may you never forget me, end quote. The police had confirmed the victim was Bianca and charged Brandon with second degree murder by the next day. According to authorities, there is ample evidence that the murder was premeditated with knives, rope, and multiple tools found at the scene of her murder. Investigator Peter Palladino believes Clark committed the murder to differentiate himself from the other beta orbiters. Oneida County Assistant District Attorney Sarah Del Miller claimed Clark has told, quote, different people in his life different reasons why he did what he did, end quote. A vigil for Bianca was held on July 15th and her funeral took place on July 19th. Unica City School District Superintendent Bruce Karam released a statement calling Devin's death, quote, tragic and untimely, end quote, expressed his, quote, deepest heartfelt condolences for her family and loved ones, end quote, and announced counseling sessions for students that week. The images of Bianca became widely shared on social media platforms such as Instagram and Twitter. In response, Instagram and Facebook removed Clark's account and attempted to stop the photos from spreading. Users who attempted to report them on Instagram found that they often evaded detection and sometimes were not considered violation of community guidelines, although a spokesperson for Instagram refuted this. Instagram's and other sites' slow response to the photos was strongly criticized. It was reported that some images stayed on Instagram for as long as four days. Eventually, Facebook added images of the murder to a digital fingerprint database to prevent further distribution and blacklisted the hashtag YesJuliet while the Discord server that shared the corpse photo was shut down. Bianca's family learned of her death through the images being sent to them. After their initial posting, after their initial posting, the photos gained traction on the website 4chan, where hundreds of posts where users praised Clark for committing, quote, another 4chan murder, end quote. Users on incel.co and 8chan also celebrated the murder. Brandon shot a video before and during Bianca's murder, and there were false claims he uploaded it to the internet in the hours following her death. Brandon Clark pleaded not guilty to second-degree murder on July 29th. In December, while at Oneida County Correctional Facility, Officials charged him with promoting prison contraband after corrections officers found a shiv constructed out of a sharpened toothbrush in his cell. On February 10, 2020, before his trial, the accused changed his plea to guilty, facing potentially 25 years to life in prison. Bianca's family expressed relief at his decision. Four days later, the video Brandon took of Bianca was announced publicly against his wishes. The video's existence significantly affected Brandon's claims of blacking out and forgetting details of her death. His sentencing was scheduled for April 7th, but was delayed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. His mother, who criticized the prosecution for portraying him as a, quote, manipulative monster, end quote, believed that his internet history, which included searches on how to find the carotid artery, how to incapacitate or kill someone, and general searches for choking and hanging was related to plans to commit suicide instead of being related to a plot to commit murder. He has formally expressed remorse for his actions. Kim Devins, alongside Anthony Brindisi, a U.S. congressman, called for increased monitoring of social media such as Instagram. In response, Instagram allowed users to block private messages from strangers. They also promised to share results of an audit requested by Brandisi to Kim in August 2019, although by December, Kim had yet to receive the results. On September 21st, 2020, Brandisi and Devin's family introduced Bianca's Law. The proposed legislation would require all social media platforms with more than $10 million in revenue and over 100,000 monthly users to establish an office dedicated to identifying and removing violent content that violates the platform's moderation standards. Before we dive into the discussion, Jenny, what do you think of the social media response to this case, specifically the spreading of the photos of Bianca's body taken by Brandon? 
I think it really goes to show just how messed up some people are and how you can really kind of do and find whatever you want on the internet. I know social media is typically more controlled, but I mean, it took up to four days for them on Instagram to get rid of pictures of Bianca's body. And I find it really disgusting the way people really wanted to get access to these photos. I I don't understand it personally. I'm not sure if it was just morbid curiosity or because Bianca was kind of well known or if it's a combination, but it's just so disturbing to me. And it kind of reminds me of like a modern day version of Stand By Me where the five young teenage boys go out to try to see this dead body out in the woods, but more modernized we gotta you know there's this urban legend we're gonna see this girl's dead body and it also kind of shows how violence can be turned into entertainment and how desensitized the public gets to it as well also I didn't realize that you couldn't block a private message from a stranger I would have thought that on Instagram blocking a private message from a stranger would have been something that you'd always have been able to block or delete. I think it's kind of weird that only in the past like two years that feature was created. I would have also thought that there was already an office and people in place working to remove content, especially violent content that goes against, you know, community guidelines on Instagram. But I guess their true colors are kind of coming out. This is kind of a story for another day, but I know that on Instagram, I people I follow, I know that their bikini pictures are sometimes quick to get taken down, but then unfortunately a dead girl's body was able to stay up for four days. I don't understand that. Yeah, I agree with you. And we know that social media has the ability to act quickly when it comes to removing things that they don't like or or that they don't want on their platform. And we'll talk about more social media related topics a little later, but it's definitely disturbing to me the fact that these photos were kept up for so long. And it's really disturbing to me the fact that Bianca's family found out about her death through those photos instead of through official means, such as a police officer or the medical examiner's office. Like, People are not thinking about the impact that sharing those pictures are going to do to her family. You know, every time they're trying to look something up about her, every time they're trying to even just search some pictures, she was a beautiful girl and had so many wonderful pictures online. And then they wanted to go see those. Unfortunately, because of the way social media works and algorithms, that picture can still come up. I don't trust them when they say that the picture is not still up. I personally have no desire to search for it, so I didn't, but I believe that if someone actually wants to see it, they probably can find it. I, in all honesty, I was a little scared of finding it, um, just doing a Google image search to get pictures of her for our Instagram page. Luckily, I didn't see anything, but stuff lives on on the internet. I think we all know that by now, no matter, you know, how many times you try to take things down, stuff kind of comes up somehow. It is very heartbreaking to realize that her family found out about her murder that way. I can't even imagine what I would do if I saw a loved one's body on Instagram and that's how I found out. I feel like we hear about that a lot. People's families getting notified through the news and not really because of um, law enforcement. I guess that kind of goes to show just how fast, you know, everything cycles through, especially with social media. The major violation of privacy of her family as well. So before we jump into what an incel is, Jenny, what do you think about when you hear about the incel community? I don't think of anything good in all honesty. Um, Toxic masculinity is probably one of the first things that comes to mind. I do think incels are just kind of sad entitled men. I think a lot of them probably have some type of mental health issue. I don't think they all do, but I would say that some of them are definitely suffering from some low self-esteem. 
misogyny that can turn into violence is also something that comes to mind. Forums, which I know we're going to talk about. I don't know if he identified as an incel, but Elliot Rogers also comes to mind. And for those that don't know, he murdered six people and injured 14 more in California in 2014. And he had made these video rants, I guess you could say, and posted them to YouTube about how essentially women weren't interested in him and how much that pissed him off. Del, you did a lot of deep diving into the incel community for this episode. What are your thoughts on them after your research? So yeah, normally when I do research for this podcast, it's like, okay, this is interesting. I want to continue to read on. I want to continue to learn more. Honestly, I would be very happy if I never see another incel thing again. Um, They, quite frankly, are really disgusting in their views and the way they try to portray themselves as victims and anyone who is not an incel as humanity's greatest enemy. So for those that don't know, incel is short for involuntary celibate, and it refers to a subculture of men who blame women for the fact that they're not able to engage in sexual intercourse. Incels see themselves as sexually deprived, not because of a lack of drive, ambition, but because of external forces such as biology, feminism, and society at large, and they think that all those things are stacked against them. The incel worldview is a fixed three-tier societal hierarchy based off of physical appearance. Incels, exclusively men, are a minority at the bottom of the hierarchy as physically unpleasant individuals. In the middle are average looking people and at the top are the minority of good looking alpha males and alpha females. And one of the things when I was doing a deep dive into this community was that they have a lot of slang terms that they use. And not knowing the slang terms at first made it really confusing when I was trying to understand exactly what they were trying to promote and what they were trying to even say. So a couple of the ones that stood out to me and definitely what I saw as an outsider as the most frequently used was the term manosphere, which is just the network of blogs, subreddits, and other online forums in which men bluntly express their anger against feminists and females in general while claiming that they're the real victims. And instead of humanizing people, they lump people into these very weird categories. So a beta is a man who's not an alpha, they don't have any charisma, and they shy away from confrontation. A chad is the anti-incel, and a chad is a man who is sexually successful, he's charismatic and handsome and clever, and incels have this really odd relationship with chads. They loathe chads, and they worship them, they want to be chads. Because incels are incels, they have this theory that even if a woman marries a beta, they still want chads and they're going to cheat on their betas with chad. So I was familiar with some of these terms before and just hearing you read this aloud, is just, it's so ridiculous. I didn't realize so much was appearance based, but I mean, I personally wouldn't want to date someone that doesn't have charisma, whether they're good looking or not. I think that's something that a lot of people are attracted to and I hate to say you either have it or you don't but the entire reason someone you know would want to go out to you I feel like they make everything look so black and white and it's really not that simple and chads are these you know sexually successful men but Del I'm sure you can think of some good looking men that are not charismatic or clever and they still get women or some like unattractive men that are charismatic and clever and still get women. Like a lot of comedians, I feel like that's kind of like a notorious thing that as long as someone can make you laugh or like someone plays a guitar or something, no matter what they look like, like a woman will want to go out with them. Definitely. Yeah, it seems like incels are so fixated on their own victimhood. And we talked about this when we were looking at QAnon and the victimhood complex. 
they're so fixated on it is that they don't see the reality around them. So they use words like a normie, which is anyone that's not an incel or a chat or the what they consider the female equivalent of a chat, which is a Stacy, which of course they use to be very misogynist because to them, a quote unquote Stacy is a woman that has sex with a lot of men and they stereotype her as airheaded, unintelligent, beautiful and very promiscuous just hearing like chads and stacy's it sounds like they all just watched one like teen movie from 1985 and just that's where they got all assumptions of our culture from right exactly and this next term we actually talked about it when we were you know discussing the actual case and that is a beta orbiter or just orbiter this is one of the reasons why they held brandon as their hero because that's what they considered him to be even though he hasn't identified himself as that though he definitely in his posting of Bianca's pictures he made reference to it and a beta orbiter is a guy that wants to sleep with his female friends and he orbits or hangs around her in what they would consider a needy way in hopes of having sex someday with her. You will also hear the term simp. It's very similar in the sense of they are considering men who hang around women, who do nice things for women as somehow not treating themselves with the respect or treating women too highly or respecting them too much. And they also have this weird thing where they think that all males' goals in a relationship, whether it be platonic or professional they think all men just want to have sex with every woman that's around especially if it's a man that is attractive this kind of reminds me of how we talked about purity culture on our hicks clinic episode because we had mentioned how you know like women need to be virgins but like men can go out and have sex with whoever they want and like you're a cool guy if you're having sex and It kind of just seems like that high school mentality is sticking with all of these people. Right, exactly. And unfortunately, the incel community is really tied into misogyny and toxic masculinity. So they have the belief that heterosexual sex is a culturally significant signifier of real manhood and that women must be sexually available to men. This includes believing that a wife must always submit sexually to her husband and that there is no such thing as marital rape. They think that men are entitled to any women that they want and they think that a woman rejecting a man is an excuse for violence. So have you ever heard the famous saying men are scared that women will laugh at them, women are afraid that men will kill them? I have not heard that but reading into incels that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we hear about stuff like this, stuff similar to Bianca and Brandon a lot. I've heard so many stories of women who don't say hello to a man on the street and then they get acid thrown in their face, someone getting harassed online and then stalked. It obviously happens to, you know, both men and women, but I feel like we hear a lot of it more so with men subjecting women to this kind of violence. And I think a lot of it does have to do with this entitlement, whether it's I'm entitled to your body and your being somehow, whether it is sex or it is just a smile from you, it's attention from you. And then if you don't get that, then fuck you, you're a bitch anyway, and I didn't want to talk to you. It's kind of, you know, you have to gas yourself up as a man to recover from that rejection you just faced. And this definitely ties into the topic of toxic masculinity, especially in incels. And just to give you a broad definition, toxic masculinity is a cultural phenomenon where masculinity can be taken to the extreme and become a weapon wielded against those who are unwilling to subscribe to behavioral control via gender roles. So toxic masculinity can be something more large scale like the incel community but it can be smaller scale too like a father telling a son to not cry and to man up and to not get emotional or 
maybe a boy getting made fun of on the playground for playing with the girls or using the color pink in an art project. Something that something that would denote that he's not as masculine and maybe showing more feminine traits somehow. Right. And they use internet forums to talk amongst themselves and to really get to the heart of how they feel about women, about other people that are not in cells. And this is a content warning. I'm getting ready to read some of the forum topics that I found on incel.co, which is one of the largest incel online communities. Virgin shaman causes way more rapes, sexual assault, and rape culture than slut shaming. Do foids, which they call females, hate guns only because it harms Chad? Should women that get pumped and dumped be eligible to sue those that did that to them to stop Chads from sleeping around as much? The real reason young women become school teachers, it's to train young boys to become Chads to get rid of incels and submen, which is what they term cucks. And a cuck is someone who lets someone else sleep with the person that they're involved in. Like, I hate to just be like, oh, ha ha, like, what a bunch of losers. But like, they really are. They are a group of very miserable people. And they love to victim blame. And they love to shame other people who have not decided to follow the same life choices that they have. And unfortunately, this is not the first case of a victim's murder photo or video being promoted on the internet. People have used the internet to promote their violent crimes, find their victims, and promote their views that precede their violent attacks on others. So the first one we're going to dive into is the case of Jung Lee. On May 25, 2012, an 11-minute video titled One Lunatic, One Ice Pick was uploaded to bestgore.com and it depicted a naked male tied to a bed frame being repeatedly stabbed with an ice pick and a kitchen knife, then dismembered, followed by acts of necrophilia. The perpetrator uses a knife and fork to cut off some of the flesh and feed it to his dog. Canadian authorities obtained a more extensive version of the video and said cannibalism may have been performed. And materials promoting the video appeared online 10 days before the murder. On April 12, 2013, McNada was indicted on charges of first-degree murder, offering indignities to a human body, distributing obscene materials, using the Postal Service to distribute the materials because he ended up mailing pieces of his victims to different places, including schools and criminal harassment of then Prime Minister Stephen Harper. He is currently serving a mandatory life sentence and would be eligible for parole after 25 years. He was also sentenced to 19 years for the other charges and there to be served concurrently, which means at the same time. Then there's the case of Katherine Olson. Michael John Anderson, age 19, murdered Catherine Ann Olson, a 24-year-old theater and Hispanic studies graduate student of St. Olaf College and temporary nanny on October 25, 2007 in a Minneapolis, Minnesota suburb after seeing an ad for her services as a nanny on Craigslist. The prosecution charged that Anderson created and posted a fake advertisement on Craigslist in order to, quote, lure a woman to his home so he might experience what it felt like to kill, end quote. Posing as a married woman named Amy who was looking for nanny services, Anderson exchanged emails with Olson. When she arrived at his parents' home for an interview, he shot her in the back with a three fifty seven Magnum and put her body in the trunk of her car. He then drove to Burnsville Nature Preserve, where he abandoned it. The car containing Olson's body was discovered on October 26, 2007. Anderson was found guilty of first-degree murder and received a life sentence without parole on April 1, 2009. The last case we're going to cover is one where someone's online beliefs led them to kill. In 2009, Anthony Powell, a 20 eight-year-old student at Henry Ford Community College in Detroit shot and killed fellow student 20-year-old 
Adrian McGowan before fatally shooting himself. Powell had a history of mental illness and used his YouTube channel to make hate videos against Black women and atheists. McGowan also had an account on YouTube. Powell became obsessed with McGowan through her account and began stalking her on both YouTube and Facebook. Powell had decided that Black women like McGowan were naturally promiscuous and had made videos with titles such as, quote, Black women don't deserve respect, end quote, shortly before killing McGowan. Many of Powell's videos were so concerning that many YouTube viewers contacted the Detroit Police Department about them. So, Jenny, what do you think about cases where there is clearly online harassment and it leads to death and the police didn't do anything before that person got killed? I find it really frustrating, but I also kind of wonder to an extent if police stations are capable of investigating everything. And then that also makes me wonder, are they taking these claims seriously? Because this is not the only case we've seen where someone notifies the police like, hey, this person is, you know, is kind of acting weird, they're kind of acting scary, and I think they could hurt someone. And then, you know, two weeks later, there's a mass shooting. Dylan Roof, for example, um, police were warned about him. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. It's one of those things where there has to be a balance between someone's freedom of speech and actually being a threat to other people. And unfortunately, I don't think that we've really been able to clearly establish that line. And that leads us into social media, which became a very big aspect in this case, not only because of the fact that Bianca and Brandon met through there, and Bianca had somewhat of a significant presence on the forum. It's also because social media has a lot of control over the content that's allowed to be published. And so questions still remain, like we talked about before, why didn't they act sooner when they've clearly shown in the past that they can? When it comes to social media and them making sure that content doesn't get spread, Their two main ways of doing it is a soft approach and a harsher approach. And the soft approach is demonetization. And that's simply the process where you're not able to make money off of any videos or any other thing that you do on social media. We're going to be looking specifically at YouTube because they have the most concrete rules and the most concrete examples when it comes to demonetization. I do want to bring up one example of them demonetizing someone. In 2019, commentator Carlos Matza and conservative talk show host Steven Crowder got into a online spat. Matza accused Crowder of making several anti-LGBTQ comments and making jokes about Matza. And then Matza demanded that YouTube demonetize Crowder's channel and stop hate speech on the platform as a whole. And at first, YouTube took no action because Crowder did not violate any of YouTube's policies. But then they backpedaled because of a strong social media outcry and demonetized Crowder's channel. They also took this opportunity to update their algorithm that runs the platform to be more stringent about banning what they consider extremist commentary. Now, Steven Crowder is not an extremist, but they took this opportunity to do something that they probably wanted to do anyway. And a side effect of this algorithmic change was that it automatically demonetized and deplatformed numerous channels that simply covered sensitive and controversial issues. And one example was a history teacher whose channel was taken down because it featured Nazi footage. But he was using that footage to help teach World War II, which many people can attest to the fact that you can't talk about World War II without bringing up Nazi Germany. What do you think, Jenny? I definitely respect what YouTube was trying to do, and I think it's good for them to take a stance on hate speech. But I think it can kind of be a slippery slope like what we're seeing with this history teacher. And I don't think that's something an algorithm is really best at. 
I think maybe having the algorithm in place to flag things that then a human can go and look at and see and understand the context on a case by case basis is probably what's best in a situation like that. I definitely agree with you. Context matters so much for the way we understand things and the way we communicate. It seems unreal to me that you would leave that type of determination about a person's livelihood to a computer that's not going to understand the context of what's going on. And that leads to an even bigger problem than demonetization, and that's deplatforming. Deplatforming, also known as no platforming, is a form of political activism or prior restraint by an individual group or organization with the goal of shutting down controversial speakers or speech or denying them access to a venue in which to express their opinion. And there has been several examples of this. On May 2nd, 2019, Facebook and the Facebook-owned platform Instagram announced a ban on what they considered dangerous individuals and organizations. And this definitely had a mix of people that were dangerous and other people that just spouted opinions that Facebook and Instagram didn't agree with. So this list included the Nation of Islam leader, Louis Farrakhan, Milo Yiannopoulos, Alex Jones, and his organization InfoWars, Paul Joseph Watson, Laura Loomer, and Paul Nellon. And again, it has a mix of people that are clearly dangerous individuals like Louis Farrakhan and people that just spout stuff that you don't agree with, like Paul Joseph Watson. And a more recent example of deplatforming happened when Twitter deactivated the personal account of former President Donald Trump for what they said was him continuing to tweet false messages about electoral fraud, which the company said could possibly promote further violence. Now, this was during the Capitol Hill riots. He was tweeting and Twitter felt that his tweets were going to incite more violence because they felt like his tweets weren't calming his supporters down. So they suspended his account. And then what he did was he tweeted similar messages on the official POTUS Twitter account. And on January 8th, Twitter actually permanently banned the sitting president of the United States from Twitter. And irregardless of your opinions on Trump, I think that is definitely frightening that they could silence the leader of the free world, even if he was only going to hold that position for the next 12 days. I don't know how I feel about that because it is like crazy to say, but at the same time, he was essentially like calling for violence and to have a leader like you're saying, don't of the free world do that. I think that it was the best decision. People have been calling on Twitter to do something about him for years. I mean, I don't know if I agree with that or not, but I think they made the right decision in the end. I will say that I really believe that Twitter was looking for a reason to ban him. I feel like he was always right up against that line. But the fact that he was president really prevented them from doing anything. And as soon as they saw the golden opportunity, they were like, we got him. Let's take him off now. And to me, that is troubling because that was his main means of communication with the American public. And I think that taking that away permanently was definitely not the best move because then you have things like parlor being shut down. So yes, he could have held a press conference. Yes, he could have done a number of things, but it's just not the same. It's not the same thing as him being able to send out a quick message, you know, him having to set up a whole press conference. I agree that they probably were waiting for something more extreme to happen. Twitter is kind of notorious in my mind for letting a lot of people's bad behavior slide. So to see them really take a stand was pretty crazy. This is like another issue in itself, but I don't think the president's main way to communicate with the American public should be Twitter or any social media platform for that matter. I think it's just something we got kind of used to with him. Um, I know that, you know, social media is kind of a newer thing and 
we are seeing how it's going to get used and more people are relying on it for news. But I just, there's something very off to me about a leader like that. The whole world 24 seven. It's one thing if you're doing like a little update or like, I don't know, a picture from the White House, like Easter egg hunt or something, but to just kind of like go off on people. So then the last question I have for you, Jenny, is what do you think social media's responsibility is when it comes to giving people a platform to express their opinions? I think that these platforms do need to be doing more. Like I kind of hinted at, I've heard of so many people being harassed nonstop on Twitter and Twitter just does nothing about it like um, Leslie Jones a few years ago she was like harassed so bad people were saying terrible racist things to her to the point where you know Twitter wasn't defending her and she felt like she needed to leave the platform I don't want to see anything like that happening but then like we were saying with YouTube I don't know if that algorithm is going too far so I'd rather have a human looking through things on a case-by-case basis rather than just a computer system deciding like we said that context is really important and maybe updating the community guidelines to get diverse perspectives too on what can be harmful and a little more information on context i definitely again i think that this is like a pretty slippery slope thing and there is a difference between hate speech and freedom of speech and I think that's something that we're kind of talking about as a country to what's acceptable and what's not. I definitely agree with you. Removing that human aspect of reviewing content, definitely, like I said before, it takes a lot away and it penalizes people that are trying to educate others, such as the history teachers who are trying to show the real world consequences of something like fascism of something like communism and socialism and they're trying to show the real world consequences but they can't if youtube is going to demonetize and deplatform them simply for showing actual footage of that if they want to control the content that's on their website that is their right as a private corporation but then they need to be explicit in that they need to say We are not going to allow X, Y, Z to be on our platform. We have these beliefs as organizations and we do not support content that goes against those beliefs. If they do that, okay, you know, we're going to move to a different platform to express our beliefs. But as long as they pretend to be the public forum, as long as they pretend to be the quote unquote internet public square then I think that they need to treat content fairly. At the same time, making sure that you don't have a situation like we had in this case where you have people's privacy being violated and you have violent and disturbing images being circulated across their platforms. Would you consider something like that, like no violent imagery, like a type of censorship? I kind of view it as like necessary censorship. Yeah, I don't think that's censorship. I think that we have a movie rating system, right? Where if it's very graphic, we say this cannot be shown before 10 p.m. And everyone agrees to that because it's like you're putting this warning label on it. But if you have dead bodies, you have other grotesque images. And I'm not talking about like surgeries and medical stuff like that. I'm talking about people posting videos of them killing other human beings. That's not censorship to me. That's human decency. That's respect for the dead. That's trying to make sure that people don't achieve internet fame and notoriety off of their horrific act. Well said. I agree with everything you said. You worded that very nicely. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about Bianca's case and the incel community. Make sure you click the subscribe button. You can find us on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube every Wednesday with a new episode. Follow us on Instagram at Crime Corruption Cocktails and on Twitter at Charade Inc. Please consider donating to our Patreon. This will help us get better equipment and bring higher quality content to you. We appreciate any amount you're able to give. This is Jenny and Dell signing off. Stay safe.